Hey, Steve Mignani here doing the junkyard crawl at Bernardston Auto Wrecking in Bernardston, Massachusetts. You know, it's been said that ultimately junkyards are all about scrap metal. And generally that's iron, right? Well, not so fast. This is a pickup truck bed filled with non-iron parts. And it's been said that silver is the poor man's gold and aluminum is the poor man's silver. And the thing with aluminum is that it's not magnetic. So to harvest it properly from a junk car, you have to manually remove it. So a lot of junkyards will take things like transmission cases, uh, pistons, and throw them into a bin like this or a pickup truck bed and then send them off to the recycling center where the aluminum is worth quite a bit more than iron. Now here's the thing, aluminum is one third the weight of steel. So we see it used in a lot of automotive applications. Let's just do a quick look here and see what we find. Uh, this here, we can quickly identify as a Chrysler small block V8 bell housing. The big hole here tells us it's from a late 70s overdrive vehicle. This would be about 20% smaller if this was a factory four speed. But this one being aluminum is busted, so it is done. And we know it's a small block V8 because it's flat right there. A big block V8 would have a rounder face. And yes, they made steel, cast iron, and aluminum bell housings for big and small blocks. The aluminum stuff's usually found into the 1970s because it's lighter and car makers were more interested in lightweight for fuel economy. Uh, going further, here's uh, another Chrysler piece. This is from a Chrysler Torque Flight transmission, but it's an early one with the parking pole in the tail shaft versus inside. So this would be a cable operated, oh, 56 through 64. Five tail shaft, but this one also tells us that it's not a 65 because it doesn't have a slip yoke. This one actually would have had a companion flange and the ball bearing inside. So this is probably a, an early 60s uh, slant six piece out of an A body. It's so short, it's almost certainly Valiant or Lancer stuff, 60 through 62. It's aluminum, so again, it's worth its weight in aluminum. Furthermore, this is kind of kinky. This right here, there we go. Overhead cam, if you know your uh, your Opal engines or your Pontiac engines from the 1983 up, this is from a 1.8 liter Pontiac overhead cam four. And it's largely aluminum, but it is an overhead cam. So there's that iron camshaft inside of it, which is driven by the cog gear, the belt here, the Gilmer belt on the front, this puppy right here. When this thing was new and not seized up, this belt would have turned that cam. Now here's the thing, in the recycling system, this would go into a thing called a hammer mill. Yeah, uh, rather than meticulously disassembling this to get the iron out and not pollute the aluminum, this goes into a hammer mill and then it gets smashed into little pieces. The aluminum and the steel are separated and a magnet is brought in to pull the bits of camshaft out along with the other stuff, which then leaves the aluminum to go into the smelter and become tomorrow's uh, transmission case. And speaking of transmissions, Let's take a look at yet another. Uh, this looks to be a Ford small block V8 bell housing. And again, there'd be a transmission bolted to here. And this would bolt up to the back of probably a small block Ford, I would guess. Uh, and again, this is aluminum, although Ford did also use some steel and cast iron uh, bell housings in the 60s behind high performance applications. Here's the clutch release fork right there. When you step on the clutch, this thing pushes or pulls, pushes, pulls. Yeah, pu pushes and disengages the, uh, the uh, friction plate from the uh, flywheel surface so that you can idle. Kind of interesting stuff. Now, beyond aluminum, there's also another exotic material which was used by Volkswagen on all of its Beetles, and that's called magnesium. Now, magnesium is 75% lighter than steel, and this is an example of a Volkswagen, uh, probably a Volkswagen Vanagon uh, transmission adapter. The engine would go up here, the transmission back here, but again, here are right here. That is where the drive shafts, the half shafts would come through right there. But again, being made of magnesium, this thing is like lighter than light. The thing about magnesium is that uh, on a July 4th party, for instance, you can take this thing and machine it and get shavings, light those with gasoline, they start burning white, then throw this thing on top. <laughs> this thing will burn all night. And here's the deal. Uh, if you happen to be burning one of these in the middle of the street in say El Monte, California in 1992, uh, and it's really roaring and you have a garden hose and you spray the water on it, Water doesn't put magnesium out, it makes it burn harder. So if the cops happen to show up, hypothetically, and you left running into the other yard and you left the hose there and the cops didn't know and used the garden hose to try and put the fire out in the middle of the street that you started, yeah, 
Ask me how I know. But anyway, these are also very popular at like, you know, dune buggy events out in the desert, out with Glamis. I remember people burn Volkswagen transmission and even engine cases, which again, burn all night long, a nice white flame. So again, magnesium also has scrap value. And we keep looking. And just all this crazy stuff, a transaxle right here from some front wheel drive application. And again, here's the differential cover, a transfer case, I think, from a four wheel drive truck of some kind. Uh, air conditioner condensers. Again, this aluminum stuff right here is worth significantly more than steel as scrap metal. But this is kind of sad and interesting, this thing right here. This is a Wankel, and we see it right here. On the side of it, there's a patent tag. It says here, Curtis Wright, uh, and again, uh, Curtis Wright Corporation, and also Sachs, which is a German company. This is a rotary engine. Now we see here it has the uh, centrifugal clutch. So this came off of a Johnson snowmobile, perhaps um, an Articat, but again, the carburetor here, and here's the exhaust port. Now the thing about Wankels is that there was a fellow named Felix Wankel, a German guy, not Rudolf Diesel, not his cousin, but again, another German guy who revolutionized engines, and I do mean revolution. Uh, the Wankel was patented in 1940, or 24. And in fact, the first Wankel powered car wasn't the Mazda. It was actually the NSU, a German car of 1964. Of course, Mazda made the Wankel very popular here in the States. And uh, in fact, here's Road Test Magazine, July 1970. And as today, everybody's jumping up and down about electric. Well, here they're saying here, rotary engines, what's new from Mercedes, Mazda, and Curtis Wright? And in 1970, the world was thinking, hey, rotary engines, by 1980, 70% of cars will have rotaries. Well, it never really happened like that. Uh, here we see the internal prop, uh, components of the Wankel, the rotor, and of course the ovoid housing. But here we see here on this page, it says here, uh, there were Toyo Kogo, which is Mazda, NSU, uh, Mercedes-Benz and Citroen, and Curtis Wright were all the lead players in the world of uh, rotaries. Now here's the good stuff about these, uh, the rotary of the Mazda or the Wankel, less vibration, simpler structure, ports replace valves, eliminating the need for valve operating gear, less weight, and space are required for equal horsepower. Disadvantages, okay. The configuration of the casting makes it difficult to manufacture. There's a complex problem of sealing between the rotor and the casing. Combustion and lubrication problems are more severe than with reciprocating engines. And finally, the different combustion characteristics have produced different exhaust emission problems which have been difficult to solve. That was what killed the Wankel engine. Um, in fact, I remember seeing Mazda's uh, Cosmo sizzes and stuff like that in the mid 70s with at the back a big square muffler with an outlet and a little secondary pipe. They had like catalytic converters and all this stuff to burn off the exhaust gases, all those things, efforts to try and clean up the exhaust. But again, the, the curse of the rotary, or I should say the Mazda Wankel type engine, the Wankel, is that it's a hard engine to clean up. Now, they did get it dealt with, with electronic fuel injection. In fact, there were turbo uh, Wankels later on, the RX-7s, and they were pretty potent. But again, they were not able to meet stricter or ever stricter emissions requirements. So that was one of the problems. And keep in mind too, that a, a Wankel engine and a rotary engine are two different things. In the world of uh, airplane engines, there's the radial and the rotary. The rotary is an engine where the crankcase and the pistons spin around. They have pistons. Uh, technically, a wankel is a wankel and not a rotary. A rotary is technically a piston reciprocating engine, World War I airplane, salt with camel, that kind of thing. But again, the wankel concept was made very popular by Mazda in production cars, but snowmobiles had them and even some garden tractors. But these things here, they kind of had an interesting humming noise. But again, this one here has a lot of aluminum and it's sad to think that this air-cooled miracle of casting technology and machining technology is gonna be scrap metal, you know. But here we have it right here. The patent here tag says uh, Curtis Wright, and it says 1959, 61, 62, 63. So it's a pretty old little Wankel engine. And again, Curtis Wright uh, did a lot of industrial Wankels uh, for stationary power units, uh, even uh, certain truck and tractor applications. So again, the Wankel engine was going to be the electric engine of tomorrow. It never happened. Now, I won't say that the electric engine of today is not going to happen. It's coming. But again, uh, back in the early 70s, people were pretty much ready to say, hey, Wankels are coming. In fact, the Chevy Monza, which is the adult Chevy Vega, has a really wide engine bay. General Motors with the H platform, the Mazda, uh, the Monza, was absolutely ready to go rotary power. That's why it has such a wide engine bay. In fact, General Motors paid uh, NSU, I believe it was, millions of dollars for the rights to use the Wankel engine 
in the Monza. Never happened. Again, the emissions problem killed it. But again, uh, Wankel's engines are the rotary type engine, big and small aluminum lightweight engines. But again, uh, here in the junkyard, it's not just scrap metal and it's not always scrap iron. It can also be scrap aluminum or even scrap magnesium. Now, that's the story here today on the Junkyard Crawl. We'll be back tomorrow with even more. Be sure to subscribe to the Steve Banks YouTube channel. Again, see you tomorrow.